our last video, we took a look at food webs, food chains, um, ecological pyramids, and how some of those, um, basically how that energy moves through an ecological pyramid uh, through the trophic levels. Well, um, in this video, we're actually going to take a look at how matter is moved through ecosystems. So we're going to take a look at three very important cycles and in this video. We're going to take a look at carbon cycles, nitrogen cycles, and the water cycle. Now it's important to understand that in our ecological pyramids and food webs, food chains, we typically don't add the decomposers to those particular items. But it's really important to understand that decomposers help to release substances from dead organisms so that they can actually be used again by living ones. So this is where that cycle comes in through matter. We're going to specifically take a look at carbon, nitrogen, and water. There are other cycles as well that um, kind of go along with this as well, but we're not going to take a look at them in this particular video. But uh, these are the three that we're going to take a look at. So let's start with the carbon cycle. Now the carbon cycle is pretty important because carbon, as we know, is, is, the, is vital for life. So it's very important for building carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So this cycle that I have on this slide is very generalized. Just understand that carbon comes in many, many different forms. We see it in living organisms. Um, like I mentioned, it's, it's very important for some of our building blocks, but it's also a part of non-living objects as well. So when we talk a little bit about pollution or carbon dioxide, carbon also gets trapped in there. So this is a very, very generalized cycle. So um, let's just start a little bit with plants because plants actually use um, carbon and dioxide as part of their, uh, their photosynthesizing process, their photosynthesis process. So when plants photosynthesize, carbon atoms from the carbon dioxide become part of glucose. So that carbon is now part of that sugar that the plant is, has created. Now, some of this glucose is broken down during respiration, as we know, and cellular respiration. So we have a little bit of carbon dioxide being released here. Now, also in humans or other living things besides plants, um, once cellular respiration takes place, um, carbon dioxide is also released. So that carbon is consumed in animals. We eat other animals. We receive that carbon but we also utilize carbon and, and during our respiration process. And so as we release the carbon dioxide, that goes back out into the air, basically out into the universe, if you will. Now, decomposers also will feed on dead organisms, which release carbon dioxide when they respire. So if you take a look at this whole process, it really has to do with that carbon dioxide that's leaving the living or probably dead objects by now. Um, so either living or dead organisms. Now we do have also what's known as carbon stores as well. We have the ocean being able to store some carbon. Um, we have the air storing carbon, but we also have factories emitting carbon into the air. So animals, respiration, plants, respire. Some of that um, some of that carbon is also stored in fossils and fossil fuels. So we have these things that are respiring, that are coming back in the form of glucose. So it's one large cycle. Remember, this is very, very generalized, and we'll probably talk a lot more about this in class. Now, the nitrogen cycle is a second nutrient cycle that's pretty important to understand. Now, all organisms require nitrogen to make amino acids, and we know those amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, but nitrogen is also required to create nucleic acids. So again, this is an extremely generalized statement here, but nitrogen in the form of a gas actually is not usable 
for anything. <laughs> so nitrogen gas, which is actually um, 71, uh, I'm sorry, 78% of our atmosphere is actually nitrogen. So nitrogen gas is pretty unusable. So instead, what has to happen, we have these bacteria that actually rest in the soil, and this bacteria is able to do something called nitrogen fixation. It fixes that nitrogen gas to make it usable for those primary producers. Nitrogen is something that is definitely needed for plants, for all of our primary producers. And this is one of the reasons why when you fertilize plants, they seem a little bit healthier because they like nitrogen. It's something that they like, they need it. So because we as consumers, we can't use that nitrogen gas, we rely on our primary producers to get that nitrogen. So those um, once we eat plants or anything that eats plants, any type of consumer that's going to eat the plant, what's going to happen is that nitrogen then is now inside the consumer's body. When those consumers die, for example, um, or release waste, that nitrogen is released back into the atmosphere, or not so much the atmosphere, it's actually released back into the soil. So we, again, that's now usable for other plants, other consumers, or I'm sorry, other producers to pick it up and use. Or once again, there's kind of an opposite uh, reaction. There's also some bacteria that will return the nitrogen back to a gas again. So it's important to understand that nitrogen in gas form is not usable for us or for any anything really. It has to be fixed first in order for that nitrogen gas to be used inside a plant. And it's actually not the gas that gets used. Instead, it's in the form of ammonia or um, actually ammonia happens first. It becomes nitrates. And that is what's actually being utilized in these organisms. So once again, this picture shows a very generalized nitrogen cycle, but just understand that nitrogen gas is not usable, instead it has to be fixed, and we don't receive it directly as consumers. Instead, primary producers have to pick it up. Consumers eat those primary producers and then release that nitrogen back to the soil, either as waste or through death. A third cycle that we are talking about is nothing that's new to you actually, and this is the water cycle. Now we do know what water moves continuously through oceans, the land, through the atmosphere, and through organisms. And just by taking a look at this picture, we understand uh, some of the different things that happen. So precipitation, of course, comes in the form of rain or snow. And we know that precipitation will fall down to the earth and surface runoff absorbs, or the water that comes from that precipitation is absorbed by the land, either through plants, uh, through the roots, by the, the land itself, or it actually might run off into the ocean. Now from there we have evaporation, and evaporation is basically uh, from the oceans. It can be evaporation from the land itself, from smaller water bodies, from surface runoff. And we also see transpiration from plants. So it's a form of evaporation, but instead, uh, this is kind of like, and I'm putting this in air quotes, it's kind of like the plants sweating. So we've talked about this when we uh, earlier in the year, where water is released through the stoma of a plant, and it releases that back to the atmosphere. Once that evaporation um, happens. Then we have condensation, so that water collects back into the clouds, and then we have the whole water cycle happening again. Again, very generalized in this picture, but something that you are very familiar with. Now, these three cycles, and of course there's others, they represent what's called the biogeochemical cycle. And this is just a cycle of matter that involves biological processes, geological processes, chemical processes and human activities. 
So if you noticed previously, it really is a true interaction between humans, um, other organisms, a geological process. It's a chemical process. We wrap all that stuff up into something called the biogeochemical cycle. Now, the elements involved in these cycles are used by organisms. They're released by the organisms and recycled as well. So if you think about it, the carbon that's in your body right now may once have been part of a rock, could have been part of a cow, or maybe another human being, which is kind of creepy, but it truly is a matter of just recycling through everything in the atmosphere and the ecosystem, and we have us.